Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our CREO 6 webcast. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that this webcast will be recorded and will be available for replay. My name is Stephanie Hung, and our co-host today is Cody Wiltrop from PTC. He'll be demoing CREO 6. First, I'd like to begin with a little bit of MRC's background. MRC was founded in 1999, initially as a support group handling renewals and reactivating customers. With great success and time, we were brought on as a full partner. We're currently PTC's Gold Channel Advantage partner. Um, we work with companies all over North America and throughout many industries. As I mentioned, Cody will be presenting Creo 6 today, but um, more specifically, he'll be reviewing augmented reality, collaboration, simulation, and analysis, productivity enhancements, and lastly, additive manufacturing with the topology capabilities. With that, I will uh, pass the ball to Cody. I can. Perfect. So, nice to be here with everyone today. My name is Cody Wiltrout, and I'm a pre-sales engineer here with uh, PTC, so I work with our virtual center of excellence and I focus on mostly our CAD and PLM tools and I'm going to be going over some of what's new in Creo 6 today. So just to start off with some of the challenges we are trying to address with Creo 6, obviously with PTC our big pushes with this convergence between the physical and digital environments and having kind of this digital twin that is you know going off of that physical object and to go with that, we've been really looking at uh, AR, simulation, additive manufacturing, and then of course, some of the base capabilities and productivity and usability improvements as we've made some uh, you know, changes with Creo. So to start here, looking at the updates and added uh, capabilities, we're gonna start with augmented reality. For anyone who's not kind of aware with some of the augmented reality capabilities you've had with Creo in the past, in Creo 5 and I believe Creo 4, you had the ability to publish some models as AR experiences. And so it publishes the object out and you can then view it on the Creo View app. And that's you know free for people to download off of uh, any of the major stores like Google Play, Apple, uh, Microsoft Store. And so then you could display your models for a review or something in full 3D. You can scale it up, scale it down. So you might see what it looks like in physical space and things like that. Uh, so we've expanded on the capabilities for it, giving you the ability to publish up to 10 models now per user. So you can publish off a few more than you were able to in the past. You can now also generate QR codes or AR uh, thing marks and uh, have different options for how you want to initiate the experience. So you can use QR codes, you can use object, uh, you can use spatial targeting, I should say, and just place it into space. And the QR code is especially important because that now allows for HoloLens support. So if you wanted to view that object in 3D through the HoloLens and look at what it looks like in space, you can do that now as well. On the back end side for some of the control, we've updated the ability to have access rights for viewing the models. So you can either set those to being public or to restricted. With that, uh, with the public side, it allows anyone to view those that might want to. On the restricted side, it's more, uh, you can have it set for a password or something so that only certain people can see it. And you can now have the ability to add multiple new emails at once that you want to send that out to. So it's a little bit easier to get that out to the users and to the viewers. Going off of augmented reality, the next thing we're going to take a look at is simulation driven design. With simulation, there's kind of been for a long time this basic pathway that things have gone through where you come up with an idea, you try to design it out, you maybe do a simulation on it, make a prototype and then get to manufacturing it. But that has always kind of been a disjointed process because you need to consult an expert. You can't use the actual design model, you need to simplify, you need to defeature and design is an iterative process. So every time you're updating your design, now you have to go back to the simulation, defeature again, go back to that expert, obviously not the easiest process to do. And so that's why we worked with ANSYS to create this new way of doing things where you can do design and simulation all at once. So we now have the ability to do real-time simulation or simulation live with um, ANSYS powering that. And it's a own whole new way to look at 3D design exploration, getting that real-time simulation, 
Uh, it's meant for ease of use for every engineer to be able to use, and it's fully integrated into Creo, so you don't need that expert anymore, and it's very fast and easy for them to use. The speed is essentially instantaneous here. So if we take a look, for example, here, um, we can start with this chassis body that we have from a snowmobile, and all you need to do is set up some simple constraints and loads, and then as soon as you have those set, either on a point or on a surface, then you can start your simulation. And with this, you can then do edits while it's running, and you can do parametric, you can do direct edits, any type of editing you're used to doing inside of Creo, you can do that. And as you accept any of those changes for those edits, it's going to keep running. Uh, the software, or the simulation, I should say, is gonna keep running in the background and keep updating for you. So now you can do iterations on designs and really see what effect those changes have and tell if it's getting you closer to your design goals or further away from your design goals and do that iteratively so that if you do then get to that last check that you might use you know, a full uh, ANSYS tool or something like that, you're very confident that you have a solid part or solid assembly that's not gonna have any issues. And currently it can do this for structural, thermal and modal analysis. And as we're seeing here in the video, you can always apply as many uh, kind of loads, as many types of constraints as you need to, to accurately describe what's going on. And as soon as you change any of that, just like with changing the features in the part or the uh, model, it's going to update as soon as you do that and give you that feedback from there. Kind of going forward with this in 6.0.1, it's going to allow you to leverage mechanism loads. So if you use mechanism design, it's gonna allow you to take the loads from that and use that for your sim live simulations. It's also gonna allow you to promote part level boundary conditions to the top level assembly. So if you set up a simulation on a part, you can have all of those uh, boundary conditions that you set go up to the assembly level if you wanna run assembly uh, in a, a simulation on the assembly as well. And it allows you to define simulation bodies and 6.0.1 as well. And then it will be backported to Creo 4 and 5. Going further with that, getting into some of the base capability updates and some usability updates that we have, the mini toolbar that we've been you know, working with for a while to improve, we've had some further expansion on that. So it's now available in feature creation and modification. And it's kind of in context now, so it knows what you're doing to a degree and gives you the things that you're most likely to be doing based off of that. Uh, so it's gonna show you the most important tool options for you so that you can do a lot more from the mini toolbar without having to go up to the full toolbar based on what you're currently doing. In the model tree, you've also had some changes. So there's now a clear indication between what the active components and the non-active components are inside of the model tree. So it's going to highlight the ones that are active and gray out a little bit kind of what else is going on. So you can clearly see what you're working with. Uh, the common filters will now be on by default as opposed to off. And we've made it so that you can auto save uh, tree settings so that it's a little bit easier for the configuration settings not having to go in and change those as often. On the graphing side, we've just enhanced some of the tools around the graphing, made it a little bit nicer to use, given it some more user detail that you can put inside of there. So now you've got a few more options on what you might wanna be setting for things like the background. If you wanna put in fills, you wanna change borders, add titles, legends, whatever it is, we've made it a little bit easier for that process and expanded on it more so that you have more control and capabilities with how you want to display your graphs to meet any needs that you might have for those. The, uh, there has been an update to the dashboard, so you've just got an updated skin uh, and you know, just a new user interface. It makes it a little bit simplified, less drop down lists and more just displays there for buttons and options that you have. It makes it a little bit easier to work with. And there's now also on the right hand side of the toolbar there, direct access to your help. So if there's something that you're interested in, like maybe creating a hole, for example, it's gonna give you that option there where it's gonna give you a little description of what that's doing and then the option to read more if you need to go into more detail to figure out exactly what that tool is for. Sheet Metal has also seen improvements. So we now have uh, some increased productivity around this with uh, 
easier and more intuitive creation for modifications on wall features. We've also improved support for corner seam and corner relief with neighboring walls. So all that's gonna work together a little bit better now. And there's been a new dashboard for the merge and the wall command. So again, just some small user interface features that are gonna make your life a little bit easier whenever you're going to be going through here and doing any sheet metal work, any normal daily work that you might uh, be approaching here. So going off of the uh, sheet metal here, the next thing we'll take a look at is this volume sweep. So this was new to Creo 5 originally where you had the ability to do a volumetric sweep that actually cut the material out of uh, the sweep but now you have the ability to take that uh, path that it's gonna follow and keep that. So you have the option to create a persistent helical trajectory curve and that then you can turn into a tool path or something like that nature. So now it's not just inside of you know, the base creo where you're gonna be seeing that, but you can actually save it as its own entity and use that downstream into some of the uh, point projections. Uh, now with this, uh, you, you have a new project option for datum point features and uh, project, uh, you can project a datum point vertex or curve uh, endpoint onto a planar surface, datum plane and straight edge or line. So, you know, in the past you could do this, but took a few steps to be able to do it, had to set some things up to be able to really translate that down. Now it's pretty easy. You can just choose to project it down. And for drill tips, we've now updated it so that you can set a config option for what that uh, common angle should be. So in the past, we've always had kind of set what it's supposed to be at. It, I think it's 118 we usually use. And now you can choose to set what the standard is gonna be. Of course, you can still go in like you could in the past and change each one individually, but you can set up kind of what your own default will be for those. We've continued to expand on MBD's capabilities as well. So we've added some abilities to the notes that we've seen kind of already with some of the GTALs and dimensioning, but you now have context sensitive formats for uh, in the ribbon for notes. You have semantic definition support for notes and enhanced flexibility working with the annotation features. So just more capabilities around doing notes, more text options and being able to fully describe what's going on with your models. Uh, in general, there's now the ability to have an automatic notification for new maintenance releases. So because we're now subscription, we're updating very often with Creo. And due to that, you know, sometimes it's easy to fall behind on what the latest release is. So you now have the option to get those notifications. Of course, you don't have to. You can choose to turn that off and you don't have to see it. But if it is something you'd be interested in, if that is available to you. With our rendering capabilities, we now have the ability to set emissive appearances. So with emissive lighting, you can have light kind of emitted by any of the objects and you can do that for a component or a surface. So just some added capability to make that look a little bit more realistic as you continue to go through and do your rendering. And something that we had in the past in Creo and kind of lost there for a little bit, but it's back now is the ability to do um, movies essentially outputting from this. So using Render Studio, you can now uh, output movies and uh, you do need a license of Render Studio to be able to utilize that, but you can now do these animations with the full rendered object as you know you would set it up in Render Studio. Uh, with drawings as a productivity improvement, we've now set it so that you can have the drawing name extracted from the part in the assembly file automatically so that you don't have to go through and do that by hand. So something that will save you a little bit of time every time you do that. Uh, continuing on with some of the base usability updates here, we now have the ability to configure background options for dimension displays. Uh, so with this, it's uh, kind of just the ability to go in, change what that's gonna look like. If there's a different color that you want to you know, display that on, or you think will be easier to see, you now have the option to do that. Lastly, here we're gonna go into some additive manufacturing updates. Starting off with, uh, we now have a new lattice type called the stochastic lattice support. And so this is a randomized beam structure that creates something almost akin to a foam. And it does allow you to create conformal lattices. Um, and as it fills those in then, it can do things like dampen waves and sound. Uh, it can be used for 
medical applications for cell beds and things of that nature, but it allows you to just very quickly build out this stochastic lattice structure without a lot of you know, individual effort on your side. Uh, going off from the stochastic lattices, we actually have more lattice updates inside of Creo6. So we now have new formula-driven cell types. So we have the gyroid, the primitive, and the diamond. And what's really nice with these are not only are they strong uh, uh, lattice structures and support structures, but they actually reduce the amount of support structure you need to build in when printing this. So they're kind of self-supporting so that you don't have to use as much support whenever you would choose to print these out using additive manufacturing. But other than that, applying them works the same way as it did inside of some of the older versions where you select the surfaces that you want it to go on, select the cell size, select what shape you want, and then apply it. And then Creo will go through for you and generate that inside of there. You now also have the ability to do custom lattices. So if there's some new lattice that you want to try out that we don't have yet, or just some lattice that you want to create yourself, you can go ahead and define it as a Creo part and then use that as a cell to propagate out to form that lattice structure. So now you can kind of evaluate your own cell types or different ideas and see what the best options based off of those are. Uh, we've also now added lattice transitions. So you now have the ability to set up transitions between beams based on the lattices and uh, kind of where the walls of the models are so that you can increase lattice support near those walls and decrease uh, support structure. And again, with less support kind of throughout the different options using those new lattices with the transitions, it's going to help you to print faster as well. And even further staying on that same type of idea here, we now have build direction analysis. So with this, you can look at uh, the critical angle inside of here, as well as the subcritical angle. And you can use that to figure out what the best orientation is to print something with so that you're going to be using the least amount of support um, possible for this. And it's a pretty good way to also determine the lattice orientation. And with this, it can actually go through and you can change your critical angle and your subcritical angle and you can have it do something like a down skin area uh, minimization and it'll run through it and optimize for you and kind of display the convergence as you run through there and figure out the best orientation that you want to be using based off of all that information. Uh, we now also have further extended support for 3MF, so just a good file format type for being able to work with other 3D printers and things, uh, so that if you want to export that out and have material colors and beam lattices, for example, you can do that and send that to people for them to use. We've also added slicing support as an output. So now you can generate and visualize slicing inside of the build tray and then export the slices in the CLI format. And again, just another format that's gonna give you kind of nicer prints as you export that out and put it into the printer or you know share that off with people to be able to use. Going into topology, we have had some updates around topology optimization to go with the additive manufacturing and improve around that. So there's now support for uh, assemblies and the ability to optimize a single component in the context of an assembly. So based off of uh, you know, where it's gonna be inside of that assembly, where it needs to connect, what loads it might be getting from that assembly, it can now uh, optimize for that individual part around those. Uh, there's also been some improvements around the results whenever you do run an optimization. So it can now animate the optimization study and gives you greater control in the results window with tools to edit the resulting uh, facet mesh. Uh, so again, just a little bit more uh, control and usability around that. Uh, there's also been improvements to the geometry reconstruction. So you can control the level of detail for that construction, reconstruction, I should say, and how, uh, you know, how many facets you want it to have. And once you do do that, you can convert that into a freestyle object if you want to make changes to it and be able to work with it further from there. Uh, lastly here, before we go ahead and jump into a demonstration in Creo 6, just to take a look at what it feels like. Uh, the release schedule for Creo now here, we have uh, kind of an example of a release every year with the major uh, releases every few years here. So Creo 7 and Creo 10 there we can see as well as the 
maintenance releases and then when the reduced maintenance releases for each of those will be going. So I'll go ahead and jump over here to our demonstration now. So we're going to work with this Polaris snowmobile here today and uh, take a look at a few of the different capabilities with a pretty large uh, aspect being added manufacturing. So we're going to be working more specifically with this swing arm for today and normally this would be made from a few different parts that would be welded together as we can kind of see here in this example but we are interested in maybe doing this in a different way rather than making multiple parts and welding them all together we want to see if we could just maybe do this using additive manufacturing instead and see what the difference kind of between those would be and if this is a better option for us. So we've already got something set up here to start with. So we'll go ahead and bring that new part in that we want to use. So we can see that we do have this all as one part now that's going to be printed out. We do have some lattice structures in there for support uh, and you know some reduced material usage, usage there. Looking at the lattices, we'll take a look at some of the new lattices that we have with Creo 6. So just like uh, with some of the older versions of this, you always have the ability to go in and change the lattice after you've set it. So you can always come back in and say, you know what, I want to go over to maybe a formula driven, choose which one you're interested in. We'll start with the gyroid here, choose the size of the cell that we would like to pick for, and then what we want the wall thickness to be, and we can start building that inside of there. You do have the option here around uh, what quality you want that to be for definition, as well as you have the ability to do a preview. So before you accept that, you can choose to preview this. So here we have our gyroid as the kind of first here of the three options to look at. Uh, and then if we're not you know, happy with that, we can always choose to go back up and switch over to a different cell type. So in our case here, we'll go ahead and switch over and maybe try out the primitive and then finish off uh, with the diamond here. Now, one thing that I should note uh, with this, we are going to actually end up going back to our original lattice type here for today. We want to do a simulation comparison uh, between the 3D printed option versus the kind of um, welded option here. And with the uh, formula driven options for the lattice structures simulate uh, simulate cannot run uh, for those structures because they're pretty math intensive and heavy kind of for doing that currently so currently that's not a capability so we'll go ahead and switch back to one of the other lattice structures for now to do a comparison between uh, the two options here now that we do have kind of an idea of what we want though we have this lattice structure set up. Maybe I want to share this out with someone. I could always bring this in and choose to use uh, export an AR experience from here. So I'm going to just start by picking what plane I want, where I want it to be in position to that plane. And once I have that set, I'm essentially ready to start publishing. So I can choose to publish, still choose which quality I want for that. And then if I want it to be published to my personal space, and if I want that to be the target, and then you can publish that out. And then of course we can always come in and manage these, choose whether or not we want it to be restricted or public, choose if we want to share that out to multiple people at the same time. Going off uh, from now kind of sharing this off, being able to do design reviews with it and uh, you know let other people view what that is. The next thing from here that we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a look at is, as I said earlier, some of that simulation capability. So we wanted to compare whether this is a better option doing 3D printing or additive manufacturing as opposed to the traditional way for this. So we've already got some constraints and loads set up and I've actually already run an example here so that we don't have to wait for it to uh, run through for all of this. But of course, just like with any other simulation set, you know, set as many loads, as many constraints as many as whatever you need to be realistic and so we have this set up for both the additive manufacturing version as well as the original version and you know just to kind of walk through here what how we set it up some options for what you want to be displaying what we want to um, be running it for and any of the scaling things like that so again in our case here we're going to start looking at some of these uh, results so we can see We've got some pretty high stress there, you know, some pretty high deformation. 
and we can actually do a direct side-by-side -side comparison. So if we open up the original one as well, we can look at a side-by-side -side and we can actually tie the two legends together as well. So if we come over to our format, we can choose to tie those legends and make them the same so that it's a little bit easier to compare between the two. And we can also tie the orientation so that if we zoom in on one or look at rotate one to look at some orientation, it's gonna do that for both sides. So now looking at this, we can see with the non-welded version, we do have slightly lower uh, you know, values here for, uh, what, for the von Mises stress compared to the weld line there. So maybe this is a pretty good idea, it would be able to withstand a little bit more stress for us. Now that we're aware that this is a pretty optimal way of doing this, it's gonna give us the ability to use a little less material. We're gonna to have to make fewer parts and get this all done at once. Next, we can come in and start looking at some analysis behind the actual printing. So as I talked a little bit about during the PowerPoint earlier here, we have the ability to look at the build direction and it's gonna take a look and show us all of the critical angles and the subcritical angles and you have the ability to rotate this around and look at how that changes as you reorient it. And you can always change your critical angle or your subcritical angle based off of the printer that you're gonna be using. So now we're gonna look at uh, optimize around this for the down skin area. And as we compute this, it's going to go through and give us a convergence graph as it starts to work out what that optimal kind of placement is for here. So we'll go ahead and let it run through here for a few seconds. Now, once it is done, we can see that it's gonna tell us the part was successfully optimized and we can now have it placed to what that optimal kind of look would be. And in our case here, we're gonna go ahead and save that so that we can use that whenever we go into the printer side. Now that we uh, do have this here, we can see we've saved that as one of the orientations that we want for that build direction. And we uh, can look at that coordinate system for it as well. Now that we've got the downskin area set up, we've got this optimal placement, we've compared it to the other version, we're ready to maybe send this down on to manufacturing. So I could say maybe I wanna save a copy of this and I could choose you know, one of those newer options like the 3MF or that CSI uh, depending. And so I'll go ahead and set up a 3MF version here for now. Uh, and I could always choose to print directly from Creo as well. You still have the ability to directly connect into those printers and set up things inside of your trays and save your trays like before uh, with these capabilities and with the new lattice structures and the custom lattice structures as well. So in our case, we're gonna put this in for our build direction that we uh, got out from our optimization here and generate our support. And you can always edit your support structure and choose any changes that you wanna make you might want to make to that, especially for the metal printing with having a little bit more advanced options there. So we're going to change our uh, critical angle to 30 as we had done for the optimization. And then we can generate our support structure. And we can see that's a pretty, you know, lightweight support structure. So from doing that, it's going to save us a lot of time on printing that support as well as on support materials for it. You can always do a preview and take a look at what this looks like before you send it off. And then we can always save it or slice it. So if we want to create this CLI here, we can run through and it's gonna go layer by layer through what this build process is gonna look like. And we can always play that animation uh, as well if we want to. So we can choose to display the slices and you can choose to kind of play through all of them. You can choose a specific slice that you're interested in to look at. And then of course you can send this out and use it for your prints with whatever you're doing with them. So just some added capabilities throughout for added manufacturing for being able to do a few more options for outputs, more options for your lattices, as well as more options around just different types of analysis and being able to look at that. And if we go ahead and uh, save this off now, uh, we can take a look at that 3MF file that we saved earlier. If you actually click on this in Windows 10, it actually gives you a viewable of that. So you can kind of see what those look like inside of here and directly just get some ideas from that.
But that's kind of the idea with Creo 6 in general is to make it a little bit more user friendly, a little bit faster, give you more capabilities and a lot more options when it comes to some of the more advanced and up and coming, uh, you know, extensions inside of here, including added manufacturing, topology optimization, simulation, and augmented reality. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of the high level overview I have for you all today for what's new. I hope you all enjoyed that and I'll go ahead and pass it back off if there's anything you wanted to close off with. Great. Thank you so much, Cody, for the presentation. Creo 6 really does increase your productivity and has a lot of cool new features. This time I'd like to thank everyone for joining and Cody, thank you so much.